Good evening, everybody. It is a couple minutes after seven. Uh, quite a few people are in, so I will get started. Uh, this is SK Ghosh. I would like to welcome you to the training and capacity building initiative of the S9 component of the Urban Resilience Project, Rajuk Part. Our component is about building code implementation and enforcement. Our training program started on March the 23rd and will go all the way through July the 14th. Uh, today is the third week of trainings. This is the seventh seminar, our module G5, as you see on the screen. The topic today is structural engineering lessons from recent earthquakes. In the entire seminar, you will not find a single formula or equation or anything like that. It is uh, uh, observations from uh, what happened in actual earthquakes and, and, and what we can learn uh, from those observations. Many cases, the lessons have been translated into building code provisions uh, not 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 always but uh, anyway i i just and uh, the building codes advance partly as a result of experiences like what i'm going to talk about uh, as yesterday, I would like to mention the PDFs that we post ahead of time. Uh, so you have access to all the slides. Uh, if you have a printout, obviously you can take handwritten notes or you can take electronic notes, whichever way uh, we, we, we would like to make that possible to you. Uh, okay, with that, I would like to uh, get started. Uh, maybe before the first slide, I would like to tell you that we will talk uh, today specifically about uh, six different earthquakes. Mexico earthquake of 1985, Loma Prieta or San Francisco area earthquake of 1989, Northridge or Los Angeles area earthquake of 1994, Kobe, Japan, earthquake of 1995, Kocheli, Turkey, earthquake of 1999, and Bhuj, India, earthquake of 2000. Uh, <laughs> that's not when earthquakes stopped. Obviously, there have been plenty more, and I have been to some of the more important ones, uh, Kashmir in 2005, Pakistani Kashmir, uh, uh, Chile in 2010, uh, Tohoku earthquake in Japan, Sendai area 2011. But but you will see that the, the, the six earthquakes, I, I think I already have 120 slides and, and I uh, absolutely could not go beyond. Uh, and, 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 and what these earthquakes taught us is kind of repeated by the others, although there are always new things to be learned. Uh, the 1985 Mexico earthquake, the date was September the 9th, uh, September the 19th of 1985. It was fairly early in the morning, 7.18 a.m., uh, 8.1 magnitude on the Richter scale. We, we talked about multiple magnitude scales yesterday this is richter scale 8.1 is 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 up there there is a very very strong earthquake however the uh, epicenter of the earthquake which we talked about yesterday uh, the surface on the the point on the surface of the earth directly above the focus where the earthquake originates the epicenter was 240 miles to the southwest of Mexico City, actually out in the Pacific. Uh, there was a resort town right nearby, the name escapes me now. Uh, I was trying to remember this morning and I couldn't. And and there, there was very significant damage there. 
I do not have any pictures from there. Uh, but then the earthquakes, earthquake waves traveled the 240 miles in the epicentral region. I don't remember exactly, but the peak ground acceleration was something like 15, 16% of G. The waves that arrived on the outskirts of Mexico City uh, had peak acceleration of just about 4% of G on rock that would not have caused any damage whatsoever or very little if any the problem was much of downtown mexico city as i mentioned yesterday is on an old aztec uh, lake bed which means very soft soils and those soils magnified the four percent of g uh, on rock up to 20 percent of g on the surface on, on on the top of the lake bed so downtown mexico city structures were subjected to this level of acceleration and many of them did not do well at all there was a lot of devastation uh, very significant loss of life i uh, People, when we went, I don't remember how many days or so after the earthquake, you, you, you never go immediately after the earthquake because that is the time for rescue and things like that. You cannot be in the way, you, you won't be let in anyway. Uh, so that the, the best time to go is starting maybe eight, 10 days after the earthquake to for another three, four weeks, uh, maybe a couple months. I, I don't remember exactly when we went the first time. A lot of people in tents, and when you say tents, you think of uh, something very temporary. We went back a year later. There was some kind of a meeting, and uh, people were still in tents, and I the, the same tents, and I understand that they remained there for, for <laughs> considerably longer in many cases. The uh, slide shows you firm soil to the on the outskirts of Mexico City. That's where the National University of Mexico is. Then the lake bed is in green, and in between there is transition soil. And there was no question that there was correlation between the soft soil and the damage. On, on firm soil, there was hardly any damage. On, on transition soil, some damage. On soft soil, uh, I, I, I do not want to use the word devastation lightly, but, but, but there was very, very significant damage and loss of life. So in the 1985 earthquake, which we are talking about, the zones of intense damage are within those green boxes, uh, mostly on soft soil, as you see, some on transition soil. And, and that is the story of Mexico City. Uh, this, this, this is not the first time this happened. The, 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 the last, uh, the one, the strong earthquake that preceded 1985 earthquake was in 1979. And you see the, the zone of collapse in green, uh, not collapse, intense damage. And then in the 1957 earthquake, you see the zone of damage within blue. Okay? So, so, so this correlation of damage with soft soil has been the characteristic of every uh, uh, Mexican earthquake, uh, at least of recent times, starting in the mid 50s. And, and it goes back from there. This is something I showed you yesterday to tell you that, uh, that the, this is an accelerogram, meaning a record of ground accelerations as a function of time. The record was taken at a downtown Mexico City location. It shows pretty regular ground motion as opposed to the erratic ground motion that we talked about yesterday. 
and a pretty regular period of two seconds. It, it you, you go from one peak in one direction to the next peak in the other direction, come back to the next peak in the, in the first direction. That is one cycle that takes two seconds. Okay. This ground motion is so regular looking because it really shows the response of the soft soil deposits of the lake bed to subsurface rock motion, which was erratic as usual. The predominant period of two seconds of the ground motion shows very clearly in this uh, uh, response spectrum. In this case, it is the pseudo velocity response spectrum. We, we won't go into those details. The, the, the thing that I want to show you is the, is the distinct peak at 2.0 second, you, you get maximum acceleration at that period. So that means periods, structures having natural periods in that range should be expected to hit, should be expected to be hit hard. That's what happened. The other complication, as I mentioned, particularly for concrete structures, as they get damaged in an earthquake, the period lengthens. So a, stu a structure that starts with a 1.2 second period may have its period lengthened to two seconds or more as it goes through the earthquake. And as the period lengthens, it comes to the critical range of the earthquake ground motion. So medium height buildings were the hardest hit I showed you this example yesterday, Ministry of, of, of Transportation and Telecommunication. I think it was yesterday, I couldn't remember. Ministry of Transportation and Telecommunication. The top few stories are lost. The fact that it is it was an L-shaped building, that means a lot of torsion did not help. But the main problem was it was in the wrong height range. And, and because of damage to this building, the, the country lost telephone connection with the rest of the world for, I, as I remember, a number of days. You have to, you have to remember, this is back in 1985, no cell phones. We, we depended on the, the telephone lines for, for communication. Uh, the low-rise buildings, whether the old colonial buildings, as you see here, or newer buildings didn't make any difference. Uh, did not suffer much damage because they were not hard hit. They were out of the period range of the ground motion. And the other end of the spectrum, uh, this is 40 story Latin American tower. Uh, uh, this obviously escaped uh, any problem whatsoever. Uh, incidentally, uh, Professor Nathan Newmark of the University of Illinois was a consultant on, on this building. He got a lot of credit for the performance of this building, but it was mainly the height of the building rather than uh, whatever the engineers had done or, or he had done. I, I, I don't want to take anything away from him, but, but, but these things happen once in a while. Uh, and that, you know, something that has very little to do with you, <laughs> you, you may benefit from or, 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 or uh, be harmed by. Uh, anyway, the next earthquake, 1989 uh, Loma Prieta earthquake, as it is called, it is the San Francisco area. You, you see the San Francisco Bay area on your uh, slide. This earthquake was uh, on, uh, let me see, October the 17th of 1989 was the year, October 17th, 1989, uh, 7.1 on the Richter scale. So this is a much more moderate earthquake than the Mexico earthquake, Okay, 7.1 as opposed to 8.1. This one happened at 5.04 p.m. Uh, so this is in the afternoon. Uh, the uh, big story, which has nothing to do with seismology or anything, 
on, on that day at precisely the same time, a huge baseball game was being played. It's called the World Series of Baseball. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but the, the, the this is the, the, the baseball is the sport in the US other than football, which is different from uh, football in Bangladesh, which is called soccer. Uh, anyway, the the championship game is called the World Series. And that year, the World Series game was between uh, San Francisco and Oakland, which is on the other side of the bay. So both teams are from the San Francisco area. They were playing. So that, all of that I say to, to tell you that people were off the streets. They were either at the ballpark or they were in front of their TVs. But for this fact, this earthquake would have killed a whole lot more people. Those coincidences turn out to be uh, very important. Okay? Now, uh, on, on the map you see uh, San Francisco proper is here. Yeah. The, you, you go on the Golden Gate Bridge. Uh, this is Moraine County, as it is called, uh, to the north. Uh, this is the San Francisco, sorry. This is San Francisco Bay here. There are three bridges across the bay. The most famous one is the Bay Bridge. This is the Richmond San Rafael Bridge north of that, and this is the San Mateo Bridge uh, south of that. Okay, if you go east, cross the ocean, the, the, the bay, this is Oakland to the east, and, and, and beyond that, obviously, the rest of California and the rest of the continent. The other ocean, Atlantic Ocean, is 3,000 miles away to your right, to the, to the east. Okay. So, so this, is, this is your orientation. This is San Francisco. The epicenter was here, some 65, 70 miles to the south, mostly south and east. Okay. Uh, the town of Santa Cruz was uh, not far. The town of San Jose was not far. Uh, Palo Alto is where uh, Stanford University is. Uh, anyway, you, you have an idea of the place that we are talking about. The Bay Bridge lost one of its spans, which is which is huge. There is a railway line, uh, a train runs under the ocean. So a lot of people use that train, but uh, the, the, the traffic on that bridge is, is, is pretty incredible. Anytime you go day or night and, and one span was lost. I'll show you a picture and this highway, so-called Nimitz Freeway, lost a big, uh, a, a significant segment of the highway, and I will again show you a picture. Uh, this is the Bay Bridge. It is a two-decker. Both both levels carry traffic, uh, and you you see what has happened. Uh, it, it took a month of around-the-clock work to restore this bridge to traffic. Uh, how they did it in a month, I would never know. But but it was done, and and the bridge was back in business in in almost exactly a month. But but for that month, it was incredible disruption. This is part of the Nimitz Freeway, the on the the, the highway that you saw just east of the bay, it ran parallel to the bay. Uh, you I, I I think this picture shows you that. There is not much to be redeemed here. Uh, anyhow, I, there, there will be more pictures coming up. Now, uh, Mexico City, I talked about the, the soft soil deposits of the lake bed, lake bed. In San Francisco, all around the bay, we have what is called bay mud, again, soft soil deposits. So the bay mud is in this brick color in the picture. The alluvium beyond that is the brown color and the beige is bedrock. So you have to go some distance away from 
uh, the water's edge to get to bedrock but it, it, it is there but but uh, along the bay where there is a lot of construction including transportation infrastructure we we have soft soil <laughs> this this one let, let me sorry i i thought i it will come up i i had other pictures of nimitz freeway why uh, anyhow i i i looked at the slide set only yesterday i still can't remember a anyway this this here is an interesting story this is uh a, a little bit away from the immediate San Francisco area, the place is either Watsonville or Gilroy. I, I couldn't remember. They're, they're, they're close together. Uh, this, this, this part of California grows a lot of tomatoes. When I say a lot, it's unbelievable amount of tomatoes. And, and they uh, stored uh, uh, huge cans of tomato juice in uh, warehouses like this. The, this is tilt up construction. The wall panels are cast horizontally on the slab on grade, and then they tilt them up into position, and then they connect a diaphragm, which used to be plywood. Uh, these days, it can be uh, metal. The the uh, uh, steel joists with with metal deck uh, either way so the diaphragm is anchored to the wall and provides lateral support to the walls now it, it, so these were the cans of tomato juice on crates that were inside the warehouse in the earthquake the building obviously moved and the crates uh, moved against the wall and loaded the wall from inside. So when we design a wall, it is for earthquake forces and for wind, which obviously comes from the outside. This kind of loading, lateral loading from the inside is, is something that I'm sure nobody ever visualized. Uh, anyway, so under this loading, the connection of the wall to the diaphragm was lost, meaning that the walls didn't have lateral support. In this segment, the wall is standing up, but in other parts, uh, the the wall came down. So, uh, as you saw in, in, in this picture here, obviously the walls are not standing up. So, this was this was interesting and kind of shows you what can happen. Uh, this is a bridge where the supporting columns have, uh, the beam column joint has failed. The column tops have hit the, the slab and have come through, have punched th through the slab. So th th this kind of a picture you probably won't see <laughs> in your lifetime, but 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 things like this happen. Just ju just imagine. So this was the the the, the columns framed into uh, beams. The beam column joint failed because of non-ductile detailing, which will be a recurring theme as I take you through the presentation and the column top then hit the relatively thin slab thin compared to the beam and just punched through this is the underside that i was trying to describe <laughs> what what you know how you got the columns to hit the slab from underneath yeah, this is the Nimitz freeway pictures that I was looking for. You, you, you remember the freeway that that runs parallel to the bay on the east side of the bay. So this was also a two decker. There, there is traffic at the ground level and traffic at this level. Uh, so a column, column. These beams were post tension. This is, uh, I don't remember exactly, uh, 1970s construction, something like that, maybe 60s. Back then, engineers are very nervous about the 
movement caused by post tensioning. So, so they decided to uh, have the so the upper uh, frame, the two columns on the two sides and the beam had three hinges. One one column had a hinge at the top, hinge at the bottom. The other column, there was connection between the beam and the uh, column, but 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 a pin at the lower end. Four pins obviously would have made it unstable, but with three pins, there was not a whole lot of lateral resistance. Now in the, uh, well, let me show you. So, so the pin was was uh, inserted by 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 doing this. This is the bottom of the upper column. Uh, this is a uh, a plate. Uh, four dowels went into the lower column, and the dowels are not long. That was the only connection between the upper column and the lower column. Those relatively thin dowels poured to a column. So, so th th this is <laughs> this is how they constructed the pin. In the earthquake, those dowels pulled out. It's not difficult for for <laughs> a few inches of of, of rebar to be pulled out. And uh, in this case, the column has not fallen. But there were many other cases of you. You see the columns. Uh, some have fallen entirely. Uh, some are <laughs> leaning against the against what remains of the bridge and and if you could if you can look at the columns you will see a lot of longitudinal steel hardly any transverse reinforcement which is the non-ductile detailing that i've been talking about okay so the uh, i i do not know that uh, the loma prieta earthquake gave us a lot of surprises it was mainly the story of the soft soil deposits and non-ductile construction. Uh, although uh, we, we, we saw a, a, a hundred times what I summarized in these few slides. There was a brand new Hyatt Regency, I remember a hotel near the airport. It was closed, it was closed. Uh, owners don't want to let you go in when things happen and then somehow uh, we did get permission, got in, and and brand new shear walls. You you would not believe it. It, 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 it was it was totally unexpected. The bad performance. So so a lot of stuff happened. Some of it was surprised, like the shear walls at the Hyatt. But uh, but 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 overall, I wouldn't say that there was a lot that was uh, all that surprising. I have to keep track of the time a little bit. Again, I have no idea <laughs> whether I'll be done early or, or we'll run late. But uh, anyway, let me try to keep some kind of track. Okay, the the next earthquake I'll talk about is the Northridge or the Los Angeles area earthquake. This was 17th of January of 1994. 17th of January, 94. 4.31 a.m., very early in the morning. That's that's always kind of, in, in a way, good. People are still sleeping. So unless something happens to the homes, uh, they are not affected. Uh, you know, something happens at shopping malls or highways or whatever, you know, uh, schools have not started that early. So, so that is kind of a good hour for an earthquake to hit. Uh, in this case, I don't have Richter magnitude. I have surface wave magnitude 6.6 .6 to 6.8. Uh, that makes it a moderate earthquake. I do not uh, know uh, 7.1 Richter at Loma Prieta and 6.6 .6 to 6.8 surface wave magnitude at Northridge, which one was slightly larger than the other. Both are moderate earthquake. Both are, I would say, of... of somewhat the same size okay so the uh, epicenter was to the northwest of the city of los angeles which are here 
Uh, Los Angeles, unlike uh, uh, San Francisco, is a sprawling area. It, it's 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 endless. I I I do not know how many hundred square miles uh, exactly. Uh, you can drive two hours easily and and uh, be within the metropolitan area. Uh, it, it, it's 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 really large and. Uh, anyway, so Los Angeles is uh, some distance away from uh, Northridge, which is uh, where the epicenter of the earthquake was in the San Gabriel Mountains. Uh, this is not far from the epicenter of the 1971 San Fernando earthquake that you keep on hearing about. Yeah. Uh, the th this particular picture I do not know uh, shows you a or, or tells you a whole lot. Uh, let me. Uh, so th this is a uh, uh, closer up view of the epicentral region. Uh, the ep epicenter is here. The you see how many known faults there are in this region. This is the big San Andreas Fault that runs the length of California and more. This is San Gabriel Fault. This is Oak Ridge. This is Santa Susana. This is Santa Monica. This is uh, Englewood Newport. This is Palos Verdes uh, Whittier Fault. That generated an earthquake. I don't remember the year. I, I was there in the uh, 80s or 90s. I don't remember. Uh, anyway, so, so. Uh, the the epicenter was in an area ridden with faults. Uh, so Northridge is here. Uh, uh, this slide shows that in the epicentral area there is quite a bit of damage, but then away from the epicentral area there are clusters of damage. That was very interesting in this earthquake. So you could you could travel uh, significant distances of no damage, then there is a cluster of damage. And, and and the same thing here, parts of downtown Los Angeles were affected or the city of Los Angeles, other parts were not affected. Uh, <clears throat> Hollywood is here, there was a cluster of damage. The peak ground accelerations were, I would say, surprisingly high for the size of the earthquake. You are looking at 1.82 g here, 1.21, uh, 1.6 something. And, and in the epicentral region, there was very significant vertical acceleration also. So uh, the, the uh, shaking was, was, was very strong. The transportation infrastructure was uh, pretty badly affected. This is a part of Interstate Highway 10. Uh, normally, the uh, busiest stretch of highway in the entire country, in the entire United States. That, that's uh, almost hard to believe. And uh, this uh, <laughs> segment of the highway, as you see, has lost an overpass. And, and as a result, the uh, highway was closed for uh, quite a while. This is not the only one that was closed, but, <laughs> but this caused major, major disruption in traffic. I'm looking for something that I would like to read to you at a subsequent. Uh... Yeah, OK. Uh, OK, L let's look at a couple pictures before I go there. Uh, so you you uh, you you see where the well, let let me show you a closer up view. So the cause of the whole thing was <clears throat> the failure of the columns like these, which are of non-ductal detail. Non-ductal means pre-1973 UBC detailing, no dearth of longitudinal reinforcement ever but the transverse reinforcement is very scarce, 14 to 18 inches tie spacing, 
uh, round columns you will not use ties uh, uh, cross ties and uh, 135 degree hooks but in in square columns there were no cross ties 135 degree hooks so so the these columns failed and and you see how miserable the failure is i mean that that tells you that there was basically no confinement reinforcement to 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 speak of the other thing that you should note is so so the this segment was so the, this segment has a ledge you you see how narrow that is exactly where my arrow is and on that ledge sat the, the this piece of the of the neighboring segment okay and and the seat length is so narrow that this simply fell off uh, the, the, this this picture did not come out very well but but you will see the seat here and and the, this one is obviously down there were i i will read you a little bit uh, very soon this is one of the columns underneath you you see the failure uh, and, and the <laughs> The ties were uh, those those flimsy things at a at a uh, you see you see the spacing of the ties you know considering how large the column is and how much longitudinal reinforcement that is nothing so no confinement uh, look look at this this is when the column is standing up okay so uh, okay. Let, let me let me read a a few things about this that I, I think will interest you. Uh, <clears throat> the damage to bridges tended to confirm the value of changes in seismic design practice made following the 1971 San Fernando earthquake. The lessons from San Fernando put into practice by the California Department of Transportation involved three key elements for bridges, for, for bridges. Okay? So, so Caltrans uh, recommended three things for improvement after 1971 San Fernando. Greater ductility in columns to accommodate lateral motions this is number one, greater ductility in columns, wider seats for box girders forming bridge decks to be supported on. Okay, very common sense uh, uh, reform. And the installation of restrainers to restrict movement of adjacent spans. So if it gets unseated, it doesn't get fall, it, it doesn't fall down, it is restrained. Most bridges conforming to post San Fernando standards survived the quake unscathed. The highway overpasses that failed, with the exception of a couple, uh, predate those standards. And, and and most of the ones that failed were uh, scheduled for uh, uh, rehab. The, uh, the, the earthquake came too early and that didn't happen. So the narrow seats, the lack of ductility in the columns and the lack of cable restrainers, those were the huge factors. The, this building, uh, I, <laughs> You know, I, I haven't talked about these things probably now for, I, I don't know, a, a decade or more. So so the names and things I have forgotten. Uh, but but uh, th this building, I remember when you, when you went around, it was an L-shaped building. So there was torsion and, and uh, uh, obviously non-ductal detailing. The, the problem here, however, that I want to uh, uh, underscore is that back then when these things were designed, uh, the column shear was calculated based on the entire height of the column from 
let us say the central line of the floor above and the central line of the floor below. But then they built these spandrels, okay, cutting down on the column span drastically. So 10 feet of column span became an effective span or clear span of something like three or four feet. The lower the span, the higher the shear that, that you are pumping into the column in an earthquake. Okay, So shear will be the moment strength at the two ends of the column divided by the clear span. So we are looking at very high shears and that cause diagonal cracking in both directions because, because earthquake is moving back and forth. This, this you see, wherever, it, wherever in the world you go after an earthquake, you will see variations of this. This is very, very commonplace. Columns are designed based on their full length, and then the, the column height is cut down by building uh, spandrels and things like that. And so the shear that develops increases, the shear capacity is not increased, and there is shear failure, uh, bad shear cracking. This is a corner column. I think most of the things that have happened is because of the torsion, uh, which is due to the L-shaped configuration of the building. And uh, there is non-structural stuff that is happened. No, it is not non-structural. This is very probably, uh, it is difficult to tell what is, but 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 this, the, the, the distress to this column is, is mainly the non-ductal detailing and the torsion. You, you see a closer up view of what has happened to this column. Uh, th th this is non-structural stuff, okay? Some, some kind of something they have attached to the column. But this failure of the concrete is what I was talking about, the shear cracking in two directions. Very, very common. Uh, th this is a bad picture, bad lighting. Uh, you do not see the L shape, but you see the shear cracks on the face. This is the same building. <laughs> this is a uh, Kaiser Permanente facility. Kaiser Permanente is one of the uh, biggest healthcare uh, uh, providers, uh, at least in California. Uh, they, they, they run many hospitals and, and things like that, private organization. Anyway, this was an old uh, Kaiser Permanente uh, facility. <laughs> there was a shear wall at the end of the building, which uh, it was kind of a strange shear wall. Uh, uh, there was a lath and and then they shot created on the lath and uh, i don't remember now this part out exactly the attachment of the wall to the structure but the wall detached itself from the structure pretty early on so that the the the, the shear wall whatever it might have been uh, did not play much of a role in resisting the earthquake ground motion the building was on its own and, and the building was of non-ductal concrete frame construction, beam column frames of non-ductal concrete, okay? So here is what has happened. The, the, the two floors are pancaked, as we call it. There was a column between here and there that has, <laughs> that has, um, that is hanging out someplace there, and, and the floors have come together. The, the, the joint, beam column joint has totally failed. And, and this, is, this is very, very characteristic. I thought I had a closer up view, I don't, okay? So this is the closest that you will, uh, I, I thought that, yeah, yeah anyway, you, you, you get the picture, okay? So non-ductal detailing, the, the joint has no reinforcement. The joint fails, the column, <laughs> both ends of a column, uh, the joints fail. The column is hanging from the building. The floors have come together. This is this is this is total total destruction. And and I cannot tell you how many of these I have seen. Uh, Mexico is full of them. I, I didn't show you any picture. Okay. Uh, anyhow, uh, you you hear about pancaking after every earthquake. That's what it looks like. 
uh, this this was the Northridge uh, fashion center as they called it this was a the shopping center closest to the epicenter of the Northridge earthquake uh, I forget the name of the store doesn't make any Bullock Bullock was the store this is the B okay so anyway uh, waffle slab construction uh, and <laughs> thin slim slender columns okay so so uh, the so where the column meets the waffle slab the slab is solid the ribs there are no ribs if you uh, if you know what i mean if i ever got to talk about flat plates i could show you all of this so so the so there are no beams in the system the column meets the slab where the column is the slab around around it is solid concrete no ribs and then the rest of the slab is ripped now at the slab column joint there is punching shear failure as you would expect the 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 columns are narrow the shear the the area that resists punching shear is low so there is punching shear failure and much of the structure fail failed and 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 the slab fell on the ground as you, as you see here so this was a spectacular failure that should have been expected uh, i would say Th this is this is part of the bullock story you you see the waffle slab here but but on top of a column it, it would be solid another one uh, <laughs> really truly interesting uh, this is this is a parking structure in uh, i i think it was in los angeles itself uh, that doesn't really matter it's, it's not in the epicentral area it is uh, somewhere in the los angeles area okay this uh, this structure had frames on the four faces Okay. The frames were vertical, obviously, before the earthquake and after the earthquake, the upper part of this right frame is horizontal. That's what you are looking at. Okay. The parking structure has partly caved in. Uh, this, this was uh, a, a parking deck. This was a parking deck. This is the other uh, face. Uh, on, on, on two faces, there were some shear walls two phases were just frames and uh, anyhow so uh, the the structure obviously has failed it has caved in as opposed to falling out uh, you you see a closer up view this is the upper part of the right frame which was vertical before the earthquake this is the upper part of the left frame which was also vertical before the earthquake and 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 the slabs and I, I i think the picture is pretty graphic i don't know that i can tell you verbally anything that you are not seeing now this is <laughs> this is the reason so i uh <laughs> this was uh, what, what year was 1984 we are talking about and i i still remember First of all, there was uh, danger of aftershock, and then there were all kinds of machinery going on. Uh, and obviously, I was much younger, and I <laughs> climbed in to get this picture, which was, in hindsight, uh, not only dangerous; it was probably stupid. But but I did it, and I'm glad I did it. Look 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 at the picture. This is an interior column that has failed completely miserably failed and 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 this is what brought the structure down everything else that you are seeing is the consequence of failures like this failures of gravity columns this is this is the deformation compatibility i was talking about yesterday this is deadly serious important let let me go back whenever you designate certain members to be not part of the seismic force resisting system. You have columns and shear walls, you have decided you will take the earthquake on the shear walls and the columns will be gravity only. You have to make sure that the gravity framing 
sustains four factor gravity loads as it deforms together with the seismic force resisting shear walls all the way up to the design earthquake displacements that did not happen here this column could not sustain its gravity load as it tried to ride with the seismic force resisting frames or frame shear wall combinations and the structure has has failed failed miserably okay so deformation compatibility is extremely extremely important remember that for all time to come this is this is another very very interesting uh, parking structure the <laughs> developer was very unhappy with me because of things i said but uh, anyway you, you you will see so this is on the on the campus of cal state northridge california state university northridge a huge parking structure i i don't remember now the, the one side was uh, well over 300 feet the other direction probably 200 feet huge uh, <laughs> this was pretty innovative construction hey, the the lateral resistance is entirely on the on the periphery everything in the interior is gravity frame okay does not by design resist earthquake forces uh, the frames uh, were you, you call them precast whatever i don't know they they were uh, cast at the job site horizontally and then tilt it up in place they typically don't do that with frames but here the contractor did that and uh, the other other thing is that the entire frame is not seismic force resisting it is the so it, it is like imagine something like this those two bays then you come down then you include another bay here another bay here then you come down you go another bay so so part of the frame on this face was a seismic force resisting frame everything else without special detailing the rest of the frame without special detailing same thing is true of the of the frames on the other three faces now uh, this is what has it has happened to the interior of the building same thing as in the parking structure that i showed you the interior column has failed it is much shorter as you see it here than it used to be before the earthquake okay the column has failed the corbel of the column that was supporting the beam on which the slab system was supported it hasn't come off but it has been dislodged and other parts of the building so here it has come off entirely and the beam has torn off the slab that it was supporting you you i i hope you get the picture <laughs> okay so this column has failed this beam has been dislodged from the corbel and the beam has torn off this slab okay Hold on for a second. Yeah, sorry about the noise. So I, I, I hope the <laughs> picture is clear. The, the, the point to the picture says, that we are looking at exactly the same thing as in the other parking structure complete and utter failure of deformation compatibility now i could talk a lot more you know <laughs> the the a, a a a parking structure of this size for it to depend on just four bays of moment frame on each side for for seismic resistance uh, it, it is not sustainable the you cannot satisfy deformation compatibility faithfully if that's what you are trying to do 
but 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 those those things get a little more intricate i wouldn't go there uh, so deformation compatibility again is extremely important and the the other point the, this slide i'm very fond of showing i i really absolutely uh, love it this, this this is one of the peripheral frames one phase when we design when we detail a frame with with special detailing which we'll talk about in in, in a month or so we want it to be ductile in the frame in the plane of the wall okay we expect that the frame will move in this case the frame will move a lot in the left to right direction right to left direction and and in order for the frame to continue to carry gravity under a long range of inelastic displacements we provide all the details that uh, we will talk about uh, uh, fairly you know in, in a month or so in this case the frame has suffered out of plane displacements of several feet not into several feet and basically nothing has happened to the frames there is cracking if you look but 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 no concrete chunk has fallen off it, it, it is it is incredible performance it, it gives you confidence in 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 what we have learned and and how we have implemented the lessons in our codes if you do special detailing as prescribed in the codes seismic performance of our beams and columns and joints it is going to be <laughs> really really satisfactory I, I i think you should have that confidence this is another parking structure on the same campus cal state northridge nothing happened to it much smaller there was adequate lateral resistance on on four phases and and th this one came through unscathed this one and the other one that you saw were short distance away i i remember uh, walking uh, you know not not driving okay but the the big story of northridge was what happened to steel structures and this is what happened Global and local global and local buckling of diagonals in brace frames. Fracture of wells and plates or shearing of bolts in brace frame connections. Fractures of structural tube braces. And then more importantly, it may be than anything else, fractures in moment frame connection and surrounding metal. This is not the first time things happen to steel structures. US steel industry after Northridge pretended that nothing ever happens to steel structures until things were found as time went because most of the damage was hidden by you, you know uh, they were behind uh, uh, plasterboard walls and and so forth um, but uh, i i want to uh, make the point that we did see the collapse even of a steel structure in mexico 1985 these twin towers sat on top of a uh, a metro station a uh, subway station and one of them i don't remember one of the towers at that time uh, housed the supreme court of mexico and the tower you you see that it is all steel construction uh, completely failed it it, it 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 toppled over whatever it has happened it has failed i i remember you you saw a, a lot of court documents uh, strewn all over you know those were probably papers that were important to people in in any case so so it is not that things had never happened to steel structures but northridge 
kind of um, uh, kind of emphasized or 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 drew attention to the fact that steel structures were not invulnerable so the the big surprise to us engineers was the failure of beam column joints of special moment frames special moment frame of steel until northridge was uh, supposed to be or or assumed to be the best structural system available to the engineer and it turned out that many 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 of them failed and and the failure uh, almost always started at uh, that weld or or the the uh, backup strip that that you are looking at, at at the bottom weld and there were variations so the cracking proceeded uh, the the first picture fractured through flange flange of the beam uh, fracture near column interface uh, you, you you see the fracture uh, fracture through column flange in this case fracture through column flange and into the column web all of these variations were shown here and there this is a real picture of, and, and you see the cracking. I don't have to describe anything. Okay, so so I I would again say that if if you're looking for one big story out of an earthquake like that, the big story was the uh, lack of performance of special moment frames of steel, and that led to. Uh, a, a lot of work and major code modifications, mod modifications of the AISC standards, American Institute of Steel Construction, their standard AISC 341 is the standard that has seismic detail. Okay, we come to the next earthquake, Kobe, Japan. This was by some strange coincidence on the anniversary of the Northridge earthquake. Uh, Northridge was January 17th of 94. Kobe was January 17th of 95. How that happened, I don't know, but it did happen. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, I have moment magnitude, not surface wave magnitude, the Richter magnitude, it is 6.9. Again, I would have to say that it is a moderate earthquake. Okay. So this is the city of Kobe here. This island was called Awaji Island here. I think the name is here. And the uh, epicenter was somewhere in between in the water. Okay. Uh, so this is the, I think the island of Honshu or something, the, 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 the main island. And, and this is an island uh, off coast of Honshu. And uh, here is the epicenter. Okay. Many, 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 many aftershocks from this earthquake. So this is the main shock, the epicenter. And then those are the epicenters of the aftershocks. And, and you see that they follow a line, which is the line of fault rupture in this earthquake. So this is the line of fault rupture, and then the colors give you the uh, modified Marcelli intensity that I talked about yesterday. Japanese don't use the Marcelli scale, but, but in this picture, it is modified Marcelli scale. So remember, 10, 11 are, are pretty bad. So you are looking at 10 here, then 9 and, and 8 and 7 obviously are less damage. Now, the most of the damage in this earthquake is not correlated with soft soil or anything like that. It is along the, the trace of fault rupture. It is the near fault uh, effect, if you like, structures that were close to the, the plane or line of fault rupture. Uh, had it bad, 
away from that, the damage was uh, uh, not not as bad. Uh, here, the soil deposits in the Kobe area, there is uh, there is uh, soft soil like Bay Mart of California Bay uh, of uh, San Francisco Bay, uh, but uh, it's not a whole lot of that. Uh, there is uh, the bay mud, deep alluvium, shallow alluvium, bedrock. And uh, as I said, there wasn't much of a correlation between damage and the soil deposits in this particular earthquake. The, the major part of the story here is the Japanese code. The, the Japanese code is, it is called uh, the uh, I, one second, uh, there is a name that doesn't come to me, Building Standard Law. Building Standard Law and its Enforcement Order, that is technically the Japanese code issued by the federal government. That doesn't have a lot of information. It gives you the loads and allowable stresses and that's about it. The uh, The uh, standard law requires you to do concrete design by AIJ uh, uh, standard, American Institute, uh, Architectural Institute of Japan. So in, in Japan, it's not the engineer, engineering institute, but the architectural institute. Uh, this is how the society is somehow organized. And the AIJ standard is like SEI 318 in our case. Okay. And that standard as a result of a major earthquake in 1968, changed in 1971. And that's when shared design provisions for concrete members was changed. Uh, changed to be uh, what we basically had in 73 UBC and, and, and basically still have until it changed in, in, in uh, 2019 SEI 3A which you will use a long time from uh, now. Uh, so, so the uh, 1971 change changed the sheer design of reinforced concrete members. That was the uh, response to the 1968 earthquake. 1978, there was another major devastating earthquake, and in response to that, there was another major change to the AIJ standard for concrete, and this now required uh, so-called two-level design. In addition to doing what they were always doing, uh, uh, ensure essentially continued functioning in a in a, in a, in an earthquake that can occur several times in the life of a structure they now decided to also actively uh, uh, prevent collapse in a much bigger earthquake so two level seismic design was introduced in 1981 okay. the pre71 concrete construction is non-ductile concrete construction like pre-73 concrete in California. This is what it looks like. I, I say it 100 times now, a lot of longitudinal steel, hardly any transverse steel. And this is what those columns do, no surprise. Uh, this is a, a, it could be any building. Uh, it, it's one story shorter than it was before the earthquake. The ground level columns have failed. And, and the main culprit is the uh, non-ductile detailing. In Japan, to make things even worse, I mean, the, the usual problems were there, the, the uh, a lot of longitudinal steel, no transfer steel. They also use smooth bars as opposed to deformed bars. Much longer than, much longer after the use of smooth bars was uh, discontinued in this country. Okay. And, and that added to uh, the problems we had. This is part of the Hanshin Expressway that runs through the Kobe area. A, a, a long stretch of the highway has <laughs> completely failed. As you see, uh, the, the, the columns uh, or, or 
peers, whatever you want to call them, have failed. Again, non-ductal concrete failure here. Uh, they, uh, what I understand is that they discontinued a lot of longitudinal reinforcement all at one location. At that location, there was hinging and, and then uh, that was followed by axial shear failure. So this is obviously a concrete segment. There were steel segments where the deck and the columns were. So this is this is uh, local buckling of the steel columns of the of the bridge. So it was not material specific by any means. Here it is not local buckling. It is complete failure of the of the steel column supporting the steel deck. So uh, <laughs> pretty pretty serious stuff. Uh, this is part of the uh, uh, Shinkansen line, that the, the bullet train that comes from Tokyo to Kobe. Uh, the, the train is state of the art or beyond, but the uh, structure that supports the rails is of non-ductal concrete construction. And, and 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 you see what has happened. I mean, I mean, I, I think the picture is descriptive. There, there is <laughs> what is wrong is the non-ductal detail. Just, just just take a look. <laughs> Soft story. Okay. So this house, upper stories have lots of walls here. Down, down here, no walls at all. Uh, whether they were parking cars or storings, I, I, I don't, I don't know why. Obviously, the bottom story has failed, and the building is leaning. I don't know if it is touching its neighbor, but it's definitely uh, <laughs> this. This is I, 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 I love this picture because it is so classic. So the upper rigid story, nothing has happened. The softer story below where the stiffness is much lower, lateral displacement is, is so much higher. In this case, it definitely is touching the neighboring building. Uh, I don't see visually from the outside that anything has happened to it, but but <laughs> anyway, so soft story, uh, uh, the effect on residential buildings. Now, <laughs> on, a, on a much broader scale, uh, Japan, I, you you have you know the 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 uh, important thing is Kobe was pretty much destroyed in Allied bombing uh, towards the end of the uh, Second World War, which ended, as you recall, in 1945. Uh, what they built in the post-war years where whatever they could afford to build and and much of that construction is uh, not up to par and and uh, obviously things happen to it in the earthquake but then even even uh, later uh, and and in properly engineered buildings they tried to save on material, particularly steel, because that was uh, pretty scarce. So they had something called uh, steel reinforced concrete construction. They had steel shaped encased in concrete in the lower parts of a building. And then as you went up and the uh, axial loads and moments decreased, you dropped off the structural steel shape, went only with concrete, reinforced concrete, obviously. Now, where that happened, there was a discontinuity in stiffness. This is the city hall of Kobe. Uh, I think the structural steel shape was discontinued at that level and just at the level above, uh, it was essentially a soft story and, and it failed. It, 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 I, I don't, <laughs> there is no pancaking in a, in a technical sense, but, uh, it has failed. So the lower parts of the building are fine, the upper parts of the building are fine, but that level is gone. Uh, <laughs> the, the Japanese, uh, this is the only time I've seen this, they, they uh, looked at the situation, uh, surveyed everything very carefully, 
decided that the lower part of the building was totally fine. They just removed the upper part uh, starting from here and decided to live with a shorter building. And that was, in their opinion, the cheapest solution. And uh, that's what they implemented. Yeah, pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, also in Kobe, uh, this is walking down a street. You 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 see this thing <laughs> leaning towards the street. This this was a brace steel frame. The braces were flimsy, and the braces have have, have given, and uh, and and that's what you are looking at. The <laughs> Northridge type cracking was uh, uh, was pretty much. Uh, what was visible in many places you 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 see the cracking here of of, of a steel column uh, the at, at at the at the a beam column joint the the you know the the cracking <clears throat> this building the the building itself i wouldn't dwell on uh, the at the at the one of the columns of the building i mean if you stood near the front of the building you kind of knew something had happened but didn't know what had happened uh, so when we dug or asked question i don't remember how we happened to get to this spot this this is what ha has happened to one of the columns of this tall building just just, just imagine this is a column so the entire entire Gravity compression has been overcome by the earthquake tension, and 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 the tension has caused this kind of cracking. This is this is at the bottom of a column. Just just imagine what can happen in an earthquake. I do not think I will see a second case of this, or will be able to show you a second case of this. I I don't have enough of a lifetime left. You know this this is this is this is this is incredible that that even this can happen. This was a huge complex that was, I think, is residential and fairly new. I, I memory, uh, I keep on saying has become vague. I knew the names and exactly where, but I don't anymore. But but the story was the same: <laughs> cracking of steel columns, joints. Uh, uh, you, you you look at that. They have put something in the crack, and and the workman is showing. Uh, where it happened, but but it, it's a it's a significant crack. Uh, I, I think the brace has has uh, uh, damage. Precast buildings in the same earthquake, whether because they were new or they were put together well. Japanese do a lot of precast and do it well. However, they their precast is all what we would call emulative. They 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 take precast components, make mon make a continuous monolithic concrete out of it. The joints are are cast in place essentially. Okay. Anyway, precast precast apartment buildings. These are, and I think we saw one, at least two, three complexes that to my eyes they had done fine i i went in uh, you, you know some little things that happened to utility lines and things like that but the buildings are done really fine we come to the kocheli turkey earthquake this one was at 3 20 in the morning date 17th of August 1999, moment magnitude 7.4, so significantly stronger than the Kobe earthquake. Okay, this is the picture of Turkey. This is Istanbul. Uh, this part is Europe, and Asia starts here. Here is the Bosporus. You you cross a bridge. You 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 go from uh, uh, Europe to Asia. There are people who commute every day, work in Europe, live in Asia, and things like that. Okay? And 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 that Bosporus is one of the most beautiful, uh, <laughs> one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. It is just 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 incredibly beautiful. 
And anyway, so uh, this is Ankara, uh, the, the the capital. We 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 the earthquake earthquake was centered here at Izmit. Okay. And, and I'll show you, and we went to this area, Izmit, Adapasar, uh, just for your orientation. So, so this is Istanbul, this is Izmit. So this is a blow up of, of okay, so this is Istanbul. This is Izmit now, that the scale has changed. And this Golchak is, is another place that was affected very badly by the earthquake. So Izmit is the place near the epicenter, Golchak. There were other places that we went to. I, I don't, Ada Pasad, we went to. Arife, we went to, anyway, so this was the earthquake affected area near the, uh, uh, the epicenter. This is one of the records, YPT is the description of the recording station. I don't know exactly what it stands for. This is horizontal acceleration in, in, in centimeter per second square. So I'm a little bit, you know. 2981 is 1 G as I recall. So this is this is 20% uh, uh, of G or something like that. Significant, but anyhow. And and there are kind of two peaks. So so there is a high, then it dies down a little, then another peak which is not as pronounced. This is horizontal ground motion in one direction. This is vertical ground motion. Uh, again, two two peaks, and and this peak is high. Uh, it, it's actually the peak is even higher than the the uh, 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 horizontal ground motion. That is pretty unusual. That can happen in the epicentral area. So this must have been very close to the epicenter wherever they took this record. These are the uh, the. Uh, response spectra, in this case, acceleration response spectra uh, from the various uh, uh, ground motions that were measured. Uh, and you, you see that it is predominantly uh, short period motion, although the motion remains fairly strong at, at periods of, you know, uh, even one and a half second, it hasn't died down all that much. So, so this is a kind of a broad, uh, uh, broad spectrum earthquake, although the peak is at uh, short periods. Uh, so that was the east-west one horizontal direction. This is the other horizontal direction, significantly lower ground motion. So here, here I have written out some of the observations. Codes are adequate or better. Code enforcement lacking and absolutely necessary. This, this is the same as in Bangladesh. <laughs> okay. I, I wouldn't say adequate or better because codes have become kind of outdated, but, but, but they are definitely adequate. Enforcement is lacking and absolutely necessary. 1998 seismic code, Turkish seismic code, much improved over the 75 version that they used until uh, uh, the new one went into effect, just before the earthquake. Virtually all damage caused by, was caused by amplification of ground motion due to soft soil deposits, if not directly caused by surface faulting, subsidence or liquefaction. We saw a lot of that. Actual surface faulting, I, I told you yesterday, somebody's, somebody's bedroom, fault went through, kind of diagonally through. So, so the, the top diagonal was where it always was before the earthquake. And then the bottom diagonal, if, if I may call it that, the diagonal, diagonal half of the bedroom on the other side was six to eight feet away. 
So uh, virtually all damage caused by amplification of ground motion due to soft soil deposits, if not directly caused by surface faulting, subsidence, or liquefaction. Liquefaction we saw, you wouldn't believe the, the, the amount of liquefaction we saw. Buildings were down, uh, uh, the entrance to a building was down sometimes three feet below the ground surface because of liquefaction. Subsidence, look look at this, the ground has subsided. Look look at the building, partly in the water now. The, this whole amusement park, the, the, the land has subsided. It is now waterlogged, the whole thing. Sob stories, usually at the lowest level, compounded the problem So soft stories, usually at the lowest level, compounded the problem caused by soft soils. Soft stories caused by taller bottom stories, as well as a relative absence of infill in lower stories. And I'll show you pictures. The latter also causes distortion when, when, you, when you eliminate the infill in the bottom stories, you will see that that can cause torsion. The typical cantilevers produce further irregularity. Let's go to the pictures. So this, this is a typical Turkish home that we saw. Uh, it, it's, it's a slab column frame, if you like, or I don't know, beam column, whatever you want to call it. The, the slabs <laughs> are, are very interesting. I haven't ever seen that. Yeah, elsewhere and I'll, I'll show you details uh, so columns and then the the overhangs that we were talking about you know this is this is where people live and those things are nice to have balconies and things so you know and 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 the infills you see the infills uh, same as in Bangladesh same as in much of the world and and at the bottom level for various reasons they don't use infills. Maybe it is a store, maybe, maybe, oh, whatever it is, you know, they, they don't want to block up the front of the building at the ground level. So that, 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 that creates a soft story right there. This is, this is <laughs> very, very, I, I, when I looked at the picture in recent days, I, I thought, you know, uh, not a lot of difference in Bangladesh that I see. No, it looks very similar. Anyway, the point is that the the bottom story has hardly any infill as you go up, significant infill that 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 balcony that makes it irregular. So so everything is wrong, seismically speaking, with, with this building. Everything. <laughs> so, but 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 that's what we built. I, I I think this is true of Bangladesh also. Okay, same same thing. Soft story. Uh, unreinforced masonry infill uh, 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 torsion. Masonry infills need to be approached with caution. This came up yesterday in the question and answer session. Initially a stiff building. Upon failure of masonry, a flexible building. Reinforced masonry would be desirable, but is pro probably not practical. I, I said probably to be polite, it's not practical. You, you, cannot, you cannot reinforce the infill, it cannot be done. Uh, it, it is not just the residential construction uh, in, in, the, in the country, like I showed you, this is back in Istanbul. I, as I recall, uh, this was on the way from the airport. Uh, they, they have a brand new airport now, uh, but the, 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 the airport, that was the airport for, for a long, long time. So from that airport into the city, you, you saw those apartment buildings, uh, very good looking share walls and, and, and plenty of them. And uh, the, they, they seem to have uh, slab and wall construction. I, I don't, at least from the outside, we didn't go into the buildings, but there don't seem to be beams, columns and things like that, which is fine, gives you a very nice rigid building. But look at the infills. The, the, the masonry infills, unreinforced masonry infills, everywhere in Turkey. 
<laughs> this was a pretty interesting uh, contrast. Two, two buildings side by side, not of the same vintage, but, but of very similar height. I don't remember that they were exactly the same height, but similar height. This one is precast. This one is cast in place. Uh, I don't believe that <laughs> <laughs> that this happened, this building has failed miserably. This is this is classic pancaking. I do not believe what has happened to this building is because it is cast in place. It happened because of non-ductile concrete construction. The proper construction, it would have performed fine. This is of a later vintage and precast is always approached more carefully, is engineered more carefully and it has done. <clears throat> this building is essentially is untouched untouched uh, next to the building that is that is a total wreck and then for industrial buildings turkey in somebody's wisdom uh, imported a system from i forget england or germany or some <laughs> totally totally non-seismic country okay so they they imported the system paid for the system built it so 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 look at this the the connection between the vertical and the horizontal are those dowels two dowels that are grouted in and this side there is no connection they are, they are afraid of volume change movement so so they uh, would rather let it ride but 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 look at this thing in a seismic situation what do you think will happen and this is this is another variation so the connection between this and that are those doubles i i think again there were two i i don't remember and uh, anyway so and and then uh, so this is the vertical this is the inclined and and then that ended so this is a piece that that came from the factory there is another piece to the right that that came from the factory and then they uh, they spliced this piece the 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 middle piece through these uh, bolted connections you you I, I think the picture is much better than what i'm describing okay it, it, it shows you exactly what happened so this is in earthquake country we are looking at ground motions of i, I don't know 20 percent of g something like that and and this is what they built and, and these were these were uh, I don't know about widespread, but we saw quite a quite a quite a few of these, and and this is what has happened. Okay, so the the central part with the uh, uh, wings is standing, but but the rest of the I I I again I I don't think by describing I can improve on anything. Maria, would you take that phone away? That phone. That phone. No. no. Thank you. Yeah. So you 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 see what has happened. Uh, I I don't have to describe it for you. And and the reason is what I tried to show you. Okay. <clears throat> this connection. That connection. That connection. <laughs> those those have absolutely no chance. Precast systems. Systems other than cantilever column systems have performed. Cantilever column systems, for cantilever column systems in the 98 coat, tying of foundations was in place, drip control was in place, minimum column reinforcement was also in place. So they, every most things were, were thought of and covered. Uh, remaining problems, type of pin connection used what I tried to show you, lack of lateral bracing, lack of diaphragm action. They, these are these are huge issues. Okay. So type of pin connection used, lack of lateral bracing, lack of diaphragm action. Should review and rethink socket type connection at the base. This this is how uh, many of the uh, 
precast elements were connected to the foundation uh, and the car value of five is a detail that I cannot go into today. The, the very interesting slabs that I was showing you, uh, take a look at, so th this is this is clay brick sitting on the, okay, okay, this is better. Okay. So they have this uh, uh, concrete, uh, how would you call them, strips <laughs> running from this wall to the other wall. Okay. And, and, and then on, on, on those strips, they have supported the clay brick. The, the clay brick that you are seeing here. It, it makes for a very good looking slab. It's, 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 it's nice in appearance. I don't know if they paint it or do anything to it, but even if you don't do anything uh, to me, this is a very nice looking slab. It's, uh, I think the brick is not heavy. It's hollow, but still it, it is not a light slab. In, in earthquake, you remember mass is a bit of a problem. The more the mass, the more the force it might uh, uh, it might attract to itself. Uh, anyhow, so so the uh, the column slab joint very definitely does not have uh, measures taken against punching shear and things like that. It, it is not what we would consider to be ductile construction. Okay, I think the final earthquake I will talk about today is the Bhuj earthquake. Uh, this was January the 26th of 2001. Uh, Richter magnitude 7.7 .7, that was later revised to 7.8, which is, which is uh, pretty big. This was the biggest earthquake to hit India since uh, independence in 1947. So pretty significant event. There was one in Kilari, Maharashtra. I remember going there. I don't remember the year. Uh, uh, that was before this one, as I recall. And and things happened there. But uh, anyway, I, I, I didn't try to include that or I, I may not even find anything from there anymore. But, but that was also interesting. Uh, Bhuj, uh, uh, was a uh, was one of those uh, native states uh, a, a small one uh, headed by a raja or nawab i don't remember uh, there is a palace uh, and the uh, nawab current one himself lives uh, away from the city in another palace but at the palace, uh, I saw families living in, in parts of it. And we met somebody who claimed to be the, the ruler's or, or the Nawab's uh, brother. And his main complaint was that his barber had run away because of the earthquake. I don't think he had ever shaved himself. Now he had a <laughs> bit of a problem. So, so <laughs> different people have different problems. Uh, anyway, so this is Bhuj. Uh, uh, Ahmedabad, which is the uh, the uh, state capital of Gujarat, uh, is about 150 miles to the right, to the east. Okay. So to the left is west. Uh, we, we visited Bhuj. Bachao, Gandhidam, a uh, couple Morbi, uh, and and definitely uh, uh, Ahmedabad. In the epicentral area, uh, Puj area, there there was. Uh, you could see quite a bit of distress in the soil. The uh, you you want to call it lateral spread or whatever. You you saw that the earthquake had done something to the uh, to the soil. Uh, this this is the uh, area of Gujarat that uh, 
grow salt. They uh, they impound seawater, shallow seawater uh, on the in in uh, shallow ponds, and then it dries in the sun, and 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 they get the salt. And, and you see the salt in the soil in, in, in this picture. I don't know that that had much to do with the earthquake, but, but that is a big thing in, in, in that part of Virat. Uh, and, and, and Gandhi's movement, remember, was don't make that salt. This was one of his early. Uh, so anyway, uh, <laughs> very, very interesting uh, observations in this earthquake. And uh, some of it may apply to Bangladesh, some of it may not. Uh, this is very typical construction. Uh, I, I think I think looking at it, you can see that this is not a cheap house. Uh, the upper portions have walls. The upper portions are, are stiff. Down here, uh, no walls because people park their cars underneath the building. This is this is true in many many parts of the world. There isn't enough land for outdoor parking. There are no parking structures, so this is the logical solution. You park underneath where the car is very handy. You come down, you get into the car and go. But structurally, uh, it it creates a major uh, difference in stiffness between the ground story and the stories above. So this is what we call a soft story. When there is displacement due to the earthquake, the displacement is concentrated in the soft story. Much of it is inelastic displacement and the columns uh, eventually fail. And, and and the building may come down. This is a, a, a recurring problem. It's a known problem. This is a problem that we can engineer against, but, but you have to be aware of the magnitude of the problem and do something at the design stage. And then uh, obviously code enforcement means that somebody should make sure that in the construction, the design is actually followed. <laughs> the, the, the story that I have been telling you from the beginning, the non-ductile concrete construction, this was a column uh, <laughs> that, that, that isn't anywhere near where it was before the earthquake. Uh, anyway, uh, the, this could be any building. Uh, I, I do not exactly remember why I included this particular figure. But, but this is very representative of what you saw, even when something is standing up and, and uh, nothing drastic has happened, there, there is quite a bit of cracking that is uh, uh, not superficial cracking. You have to look and, 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 and do something if you are going to continue to uh, use this, 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 this structure. And this was something else. So, uh, you, 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 you look at that, look at that. Same thing that we saw at that bridge in the San Francisco area. Yeah. The, uh, whether it was flat plate construction and the columns have simply punched through or whether it was beam column construction, the beam column joint failed, and then the column punched through the slab. I, I do not know, we couldn't get in. I, you, you cannot, you, you shouldn't get into a building like that. There are potential problems. So we, we couldn't, we were not allowed in. So I, I do not know which way, but, but obviously the column has punched through the slab. Uh, that can have happened because it was flat plate construction, there were no beams, it was a punching shear failure, or it can have happened because the beam column joint simply failed and the column top got dislodged, hit the slab and came through. But, but the, the 
yeah, length of the penetration is so high because this building pretty much had lost the ground floor, as I recall. <clears throat> this, this, I don't think you will see uh, too too often, uh, if ever. So th this was a building that had its uh, core where uh, they had uh, elevator, staircase, etc. kind of to one side of the building, to one corner of the building, if you like. And uh, that, that uh, part, of, part of it is rigid. It's, it's, it's basically all walls except for the openings there to the front. Uh, anyway, uh, the the that particular aspect plus other in other uh, uh, aspects of the layout of the building meant there was a lot of torsion that the building was dealing with. So in the earthquake, uh, because of the torsion, the shear wall core simply detached itself from the building. Okay, so they were together, all connected before the earthquake. Now these are two separate buildings. To its credit, this thing is standing up. The building is also kind of standing up after a fashion, but I don't remember now. <laughs> this, is, this is not a redeemable thing. You have to remove it. You, you cannot. This is not a repairable situation. So, uh, and, and, and can you salvage that core? I, I, I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> so uh, I showed you pictures from Nigata, Japan, 1964, piles pulling out and, and, and building toppled. So you see that uh, in Bhuj. So this was a building, obviously, was vertical before the earthquake. Now it is lying on its side. A, a building lying on its side like this, as if it has gone to sleep or something, I, I again, had never seen before. And uh, that's because the piles pulled out, pulled straight out of the ground. Uh, uh, liquefaction or something approaching liquefaction obviously is the explanation but 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 the point is that these things happen this you 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 have to see to believe it but it does happen and 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 the fact that that it does happen tells you to be careful to 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 be mindful in this that that's the whole point of the presentation today that that these are things you have to think about Okay, when when you do the business of designing buildings, and and the and the code enforcers have to think about these things that 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 whatever was written in, in the code is for a reason. Okay, I I come back to the statistics uh, that I have shown uh, many times, uh, including uh, I I think maybe in the first seminar so. I, I wouldn't uh, belabor the point at the same time. Uh, it, it is so important that that I, I probably should spend, uh, be, because not everybody, I don't know how many, yesterday was a uh, staggering number of, of uh, attendance, 560 or something. So not everybody, uh, I, I don't know how many there are today, uh, but not everybody has listened to what I said, so maybe I'll repeat uh, briefly. Uh, this page, so this, these are statistics from the Disaster Prevention Research Institute of Kyoto University who surveyed 1638 reinforced concrete buildings and 1032 steel buildings following the Kobe earthquake. And these are their statistics. Reinforced concrete buildings, 56% is uh, basically without damage. Uh, 21 plus 11, that is 32% has moderate or minor damage. And 13% has uh, severe damage or collapse. 
Steel buildings, 1032, 40% is without damage. So in this particular case, concrete did, did somewhat better. 29 plus 17 is 46% moderate damage or, or uh, uh, minor damage and 14% uh, severe damage or collapse. This I do not believe I have shown before, but, but this one I have seen, I have shown a number of times. It, it's that important in my mind. So on the x-axis is the age of the structures that were surveyed by this Disaster Prevention Research Institute. These are buildings constructed before 65, between 66 and 70, between 71 and 75, 91 onwards. The earthquake was in 95, so 91 onwards is, is what we are talking about. Yeah. Uh, yellow is severe damage or collapse. The purple is uh, moderated damage. The red is minor damage and green is no damage, okay? So something like 60% of the older buildings has severe damage or collapse and only about 10% or lower than 10% has no damage. You go to slightly newer construction the severe damage decreases, no damage increases. Even newer picture gets better. By the time you are, so 71 was the big code change, remember. Shear design became the way we do shear design in the United States. Post-1971 buildings, you, you see that by the time we are looking at 76 to 80, obviously when a code goes into effect, <laughs> structures designed by that code don't immediately spring up, okay? So 76 to 80 is more of a reflection of the effect of the new code. You see that severe damage and collapse have decreased significantly and no damage has increased. So six, 71 is the big code change, 81 is the next big code change, okay? Post-1981 structures, no severe damage or collapse. And post-91, no damage, no damage whatsoever. So that, that tells you about what building codes can do for you if they're properly formulated, but much more importantly, if they're properly enforced. In Japan, enforcement of the building code is something that goes without saying. Japanese are law abiding people. They do not break the law even when nobody is looking. They, they just do not do that. If, if the code and the law require something to be done, you can absolutely count on the fact that it will be done. And, and, and because of that level of code enforcement and the fact that the codes are basically sound, they don't change their codes every three years like the US does, they have been happy with these 81 changes and they're still living with them. But because of proper enforcement and proper codes, they have done so much better than many, many other countries. So this, these statistics to me, uh, very, very important. So I, I have a few very simple uh, uh, things that I, I think uh, <laughs> good to preach. Uh, very difficult to uh, actually implement because there are pressures. Architects want interesting layouts. Owners want ideally no columns. They want to rent the entire space. Uh, 
<laughs> in, in, in Hawaii, I see this taken to an extreme. Really, nobody, nobody wants columns or walls or anything. No, no visible means of support is what they would like. The entire space, particularly when it is a an ocean facing building, you know, open everything up. Why, why bother with columns? You know, why bother? <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I mean, we we can say what should be done, but then you know, the people with the money will dictate what you will actually do. Uh, and and architects have their own thing, so so engineers are at a disadvantage. But but then again, it it is the engineer's responsibility to keep the structure, keep the structure intact when it is subject to unusual loading. Okay, so so th these are these are things that we should aim for: make building simple in plan and elevation with a minimum of setbacks or changes in section. Okay. I, I would again repeat, easier said than done, because, because no architect would want a box building, I can assure you, but, but the more complex the layout becomes, horizontally, vertically, the more problems you are looking at. So make buildings simple in plan and elevation, with a minimum of setbacks or changes in section. Avoid discontinuities in strength, stiffness, and geometry. Okay, all three are important. Strength discontinuity, we talk about weak study. Stiffness discontinuity, we talk about soft study, but there can be geometric in, in uh, uh, discontinuity also okay a, a, a column <laughs> this was a this was a huge problem in 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 Bangalore uh, so they not only have the ground level open for parking as you go up they 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 go horizontally out so they may have a five foot uh, horizontal extension beyond the outer column line because that is very nice space to have and and many times the the columns in the parking area do not go straight up there is an offset the the, the columns above do not align with the columns in the parking area so uh, anyway avoid discontinuities in strength stiffness and geometry keep building symmetrical to the extent possible and that will keep torsion away. And, and that does you so much good that you wouldn't believe. The less torsion you have to deal with, the better off you are, okay? So it's as simple as that. Keep building symmetrical to the extent possible, avoid torsion. Provide continuous load path from point of origin down to the foundation. You have no choice. This is, this is, this is what we do. This is, <laughs> This is the essence of what we do, provide load path. As direct as possible, I didn't say it on this slide, as direct as possible, and redundant load paths, not just one way for the loads to go, multiple ways for the loads to go. One fails, it, it, it will take an alternate route. That's the idea, okay? Adequately tie together all structural elements making up a building or portion thereof. Adequately tie it together or separate them by a distance that prevents hammering, one way or the other. You cannot be in between. Okay, so adequately tie all structural elements making up a building or portion thereof. Either tie different portions of buildings together or separate them by sufficient distance to prevent handling. Carefully approach the use of very stiff walls to fill spaces between relatively more flexible frame elements that the infill is what we are talking about. Okay. This, this is, this is a, a, a huge problem in Bangladesh that uh, has to be has to be tackled and solved in 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 one way or the other. I am absolutely totally convinced 
that this is the biggest problem that needs to be solved as far as the the earthquake resiliency of the city and the country uh, is, is concerned. The, the, this unreinforced masonry infills that we basically do not pay any attention to in, in design. Uh, this is not sustainable. Something has to happen. Support buildings, particularly multi-story buildings on a firm stratum. Yeah. Again, the, this may be easier said than done, but, but if you have soil problems, go with piles, more expensive solutions. You, 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 you have to find the you have to find the stratum where your 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 structure can be supported depending upon its weight and so forth okay i i think i think that's as much as i wanted to say uh again i'm a little bit early which is good uh we'll open it up i, I think maria will do whatever needs to be done <laughs> so to the best of our ability to judge the very first question says is there any codal provision exists to resist captive column failure the, this terminology of captive column is not uh, standard so i i think you are talking about a column that does not continue all the way down to the ground if if that is true there is no uh, specific uh, uh, regulation about the column. Well, how, how do I want to say? So if you have that situation, your structure will be classified as irregular. There is a table of vertical irregularities. It will fall in one or more of the categories and that will trigger uh, code requirements that you will have to follow and also a uh, let me think for a second yeah that that that's uh, that's all i'm going to say Be because for that column in particular i do not believe we have any uh, uh, specific requirements but irregularity will be triggered and the code provisions that you have to follow when the irregularities are triggered should take care of that column. Okay, next this question. This. Mm -hmm. this go down arrow. Down arrow. Yeah, but this okay. one, yeah, okay. So why shear wall carry more lateral load than column if we maintain same dimension? Why we maintain same dimension part, I do not understand. But but uh, typically, <laughs> nothing is simple. So I have to say if the diaphragm is rigid. If a, a rigid diaphragm, rigid means in plane, a diaphragm that does not deflect too much in its own plane is a rigid diaphragm. Most concrete slabs are rigid diaphragms and rigid diaphragms impose equal displacements on the vertical elements. So you have columns and shear walls on the same level of a building. If the diaphragm connecting them, diaphragms connecting them are rigid, they will be subject to the same lateral displacements. Then the stiffer elements will attract more force. A shear wall is typically much stiffer than a column. Remember, I is proportional to the square root of length. So, so that, that is the very simple reason. Whatever is more rigid will get more loads. Okay, is epicenter located in joint of two plates? No. Uh, so, you are referring to tectonic plates. Tectonic plates are moving all the time. Uh, the, we were talking yesterday about faults, which are weaknesses in the crust of the earth. Most faults, not all, are close to boundaries of tectonic plates. Okay. 
Now, when a fault ruptures, the strain buildup is too much for it. The rupture originates underneath the surface of the earth someplace at a, at a location called the focus of the earthquake. Okay, so focus is where the earthquake originates and that is down below someplace. Shallow earthquakes, the focus may be two, three miles down. In a, in a deep focus earthquake, it may be 25, 30 miles down. The point vertically above the focus on the surface of the earth is the epicenter. Okay, so the epicenter is definitely not necessarily at the plate boundaries. It, it almost never is. Why plate move? Why are tectonic plates moving? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I would refer you, you know, go to the internet and just ask that question. Why do tectonic plates move? And there, there, are, <laughs> there are forces at work that I do not fully understand. That, 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 that. <laughs> this, is, this is not, uh, how should I say, no. Yeah, all, all the, 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 you know, the earth was a molten mass at the beginning and then the surface cooled, the interior is still molten. We, we, we see that when a volcano erupts and, and the motion of the plates has something to do with the fact that the earth is still evolving. It is still cooling the, and, and, and things like that, very basic things that, uh, uh, answers these days are, are available on the internet. Uh, little problem in sound. Okay. What are the conditions for designing lifeline facilities such as buried pipeline carrying water, gas, etc. due to permanent ground deformation? That is a good question. I do not have an answer without looking. Uh, building codes do not cover them. Uh, there are documents available in this country. I do not believe that they are uh, standard. Some things are covered in uh, in the non non building structures chapter, but but most things that you are talking about are not covered by building codes. They fall under other jurisdictions. What regulations are available, particularly in Bangladesh, I do not know, but this can be found out. Uh, you can you can find out. Uh, we, we can try to find out. What is the difference between spectral acceleration and maximum ground acceleration? Very, very different. Uh, maximum ground acceleration, you understand, is the, is the peak acceleration of the ground as it moves back and forth in an earthquake. Spectral acceleration is the maximum acceleration, maximum of a single degree of freedom system that itself is a complication uh, to a particularly a particular ground motion for a particular amount of damping. Now all of that details aside, a single degree of freedom system is where one movement of one mass is possible. So, so if you have a one-story building, most of the mass will be at the roof level and you can reasonably idealize it as a, a weightless stick with a mass at the top. This will be a single degree of freedom system and the maximum acceleration that this system will experience in when the base is subjected to a ground motion would be the spectral acceleration. This is something I would, you know, you know, with, with 24 modules, we, we still will have major, major topics that I will not be able to touch. And, and I do not know what the solution is. I, I, I honestly do not know. 
a, a lot more training is needed that <laughs> I personally at this point have no way of, 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 of providing it it's it's uh, okay so but but this response spectrum spectral acceleration spectral velocity spectral displacement all of these things are part of structural dynamics that I would love to explain if there is an opportunity. Okay. Uh, what is 2% response spectrum? I, I do not know what a 2% response spectrum is. I believe that you are talking about a response spectrum for 2% of damping, 2% of critical damping. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what you are talking about for 2% for of critical damping. Every response spectrum is for a particular amount of damp. I think the I question like was in response to a slide that had that heading two percent response spectrum. Yeah, but the answer is answer but, is but, but the answer is obviously this. Yes. Okay. Can you explain the dual system and building frame system for the steel structure with bracings? Okay. Uh, so I I I explained it yesterday with uh, with frames and shear walls brace frame is the same as shear walls so a dual system with brace frames will be where you design the so a, a a dual system with brace frame would be a combination of moment frames and brace frames you will design the moment frames and base frames based on interactive analysis. The, you will analyze the whole building. You will see how much goes, how much of the story share goes to the brace frame and how much to the moment frame at every level. You will design on that basis. And then the moment frame has to be designed for at least a quarter of the design lateral forces independently of the braced frame. So, so brace frame in steel takes the place of the shear wall in concrete. Designer provided general notes and, and suggests to use 60 KSI grades, 60 grade steel because 60 KSI used to design. But in common practice at site used 72.5 KSI and designer also allowed to use 500 grade steel uh, to be are uh, also available in market. Does it make over the infrastructure? That is a very good question. So just increasing the steel strength uh, does not. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, just increasing the reinforcement strength does not make a member uh, 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 over reinforced so you you can so you have you have five bars of grade 60 reinforcement if you have four four bars of grade 72 reinforcement you 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 you, you don't have an over reinforced situation or three bars of grade uh, uh, what was the other one <laughs> anyway you you get that you 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 understand the concept so as the strength increases if you drop off the amount of reinforcement you do not end up with an over reinforced situation so that part is simple w what is not simple is the properties of the reinforcement are different grade 60 stress strain curve looks very different from grade 72 and a half stress strain curve and and the ductility of the material the inelastic deformation capacity of the material comes from the shape of the stress strain curve so so you have to be careful it is not as simple as just keep the 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 uh, product of the bar area and the strength the same that 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 is helpful that is something that that will help but but in addition the high strength reinforcement has to have inelastic deformation capacity otherwise you 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 are looking at potential problems yeah i i believe the question meant to say that the number of bars remain the same uh, remains the same if the number of at, bars at the site they just replace the 60 ksi bar with a 72.5 ksi bar that's it that you cannot do in an earthquake situation 
You absolutely cannot do that without checking things out. I I, I really mean it. You you cannot <laughs> just just substitute with 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 higher. And just like you cannot throw in four bars where three are called for, you cannot throw in high grade reinforcement where the lower grade is called for. That that cannot be done in earthquake resistant. Uh, please provide recorded video if possible. Yeah, we, we are going to provide them. We discussed it and I do not know where. I think I... I was supposed to ask Raju for permission whether I did. I, I have to check. We we did we did discuss it. We will make the recording available. No problem. Uh, uh, so give, give us a day or two that they will be available to you. Uh, yeah, we, we will make everything available to the extent we can. Can two identical structures having same mass in geometry have different natural fit? This question I read yesterday. Uh, yesterday was the same mass, today it says same mass and geometry. Uh, geometry, I don't know, is, is not a very definite term. Uh, if you have the same mass and the same stiffness, then you will have the same period. If you have the same mass and not the same stiffness, then uh, the period can very well be different. In a steel mezzanine floor system, where concrete slab is used only as a covering material, can diaphragm be considered? And can we take that slab stiffness into account? This question is not clear to me. Steel mezzanine floor system, concrete slab is used only as a covering material. Do you understand this, bro? I think he means the the floor itself is the you know the the structural part of the floor is a steel joist or something, and on top of that there is a concrete layer which is not composite to the steel. So the floor system is a steel the steel mezzanine. I understand that part, but it is a mezzanine. So so there is a uh, there is a concrete layer on the on the steel steel floor. Yeah, but this diaphragm action, I don't understand. If we can count on the concrete for diaphragm action. If it is not composite to the steel, then I don't think so. It, the, these mezzanines, the, the, they are, they're quite often cantilevers. There is really no, not necessarily a connection so where where would the shear go? I, I it's very questionable. I would say I I don't know. I mean I have to have more specifics to answer you properly. But I it seems very far fetched that that what you are describing will act as a diaphragm. I I would say that much. Uh, why the gravity column failed where this was a frame structure? Nineteen ninety four LA earthquake. It's not a frame structure. <laughs> it's the the okay. So I, I I think this is very fundamental for everybody to understand. It's not a question of frame structure, shear wall structure, what type of structure. Any time, certain structural members, some structural members are designated not to be part of the seismic force resisting system. Okay, you have ten columns in your, in your you have ten columns in your building, and you decide earthquake will be resist earthquake forces will be resisted by six columns, and the other four columns will be gravity columns. Okay, engineer is free to decide that the code gives him that license. If you make that decision, then these four gravity columns must be checked to make sure that they sustain the full factored gravity loads as they deform together with the six seismic force resisting columns all the way up to 
the design earthquake displacements. This is deformation compatibility. Any time you have excluded a structural member from the seismic force resisting system, you have to check deformation compatibility. It can be a shear wall frame structure, it can be a frame structure, it can be a, in, in a shear wall structure, the same thing. You have six shear walls, you have decided to take the forces on four of them, two of them are gravity walls, you have to do the same check, okay? So, so the key thing is that you have excluded something by your decision from participation in seismic resistance. In reality, the earthquake doesn't know and it doesn't care what you have assumed, okay? If you have 10 columns in a building, all 10 columns will be resisting earthquake forces. Make no mistake about it. These assumptions we make as design devices, if we, we are allowed to design and detail only six out of 10 columns for earthquake resistance and spare the other four from special detailing, if we are able to satisfy deformation compatibility, that that's what we are saying. Okay, hopefully that is clear, but, but I have no way of knowing. <laughs> okay. Uh, would you please share how to ensure deformation just a second <laughs> would you please i think you want to say share how to ensure deformation compatibility during structural design so would you share how to ensure deformation compatibility during structural design? This is definitely not something I can tell you in a minute or two. This is this is not easy. Uh, I have a concrete book that does show how to do that. Uh, uh, see, uh, Structural Engineers of California had a simpler way of doing that. I I don't know that I'll find it easily. Anyway, there is literature available. It's not, it's not a simple thing. It, it needs, to be, needs to be taught, it needs to be understood, needs to be properly implemented. So this is not a question I can answer in, in, in this kind of a forum. We know the capacity of Complete joint penetration weld is same of the parent materials. So what is the reason of joint failures of the shown weld connections? Is it the matter of improper weld process which made the weld materials and parent material brittle? Can you kindly explain? Thank for your kind response. This again is a... Uh, there is so much post-1994 literature that, that went into all of these things. And I, I, I personally do not keep track of uh, uh, steel developments that closely, but, but if it interests you, uh, I, I could refer you to uh, some of the important references from that time. There was a SAC Joint Ventures, uh, Structural Engineers Association of California, Applied Technology Council, and uh, California Universities for Earthquake Engineering Research. The three organizations together did a lot of research looking into the causes that you are asking about, but also looking for solutions. So you you have to delve into some of that material to to find the answers to the questions you are asking. Why USA had not adopted code provisions from Japan for earthquake in 1980 and 1990? Uh, uh, part of your question is valid, part of, is, part of it is not valid. First of all, it's not 1980 or 1990. We talked about two major changes in Japanese codes. One in 1971, which was essentially ductile detailing for columns to prevent premature shear failure and things like that. 
This was implemented in the 1973 UBC. In, in, the, in the Japanese case, it was the 71 change was because of the 1968 Tokachi Oki earthquake. In the, in the case of the US, the 1973 UBC changes were the result of the 1971 San Fernando earthquake. Both countries implemented uh, similar uh, detailing requirements. Uh, California detailing requirements or US detailing requirements are significantly more stringent than the Japanese requirements because the Japanese provide more strength to their structures than we do. So there are differences, but the spirit was the same. And, and the US definitely, definitely have implemented what, what Japan did in 71. The two-step design uh, prevent damage in earthquakes then occur several times in the life of a structure and prevent uh, collapse in, in less frequent earthquakes. That has not been adopted in the US. Uh, I don't know, these things have never have one reason. It has been discussed so far, consensus has not been reached. Uh, we are now uh, discussing in a vigorous way uh, so-called functional recovery, how to, uh, we, we prevent collapse in the maximum considered earthquake. That provides life safety in the design earthquake. So the big thing we are taking care of. We are now talking seriously about functional recovery, structure regaining function within a short period of time following an earthquake and the entire community going back to life within a short period after the earthquake. How quickly something like that can be implemented in our codes, I cannot tell you sitting here today, but, but I think in the next decade, we will see significant developments. Why quiz question and slide materials are not related? That I cannot answer. Yeah, people ask. <laughs> We we cannot we cannot dictate what people will ask. So you know that, that that's that that's that's fine. I I don't I don't particularly mind. Uh, it's okay. Uh, Japan Building Disaster Prevention Association has published three level screening method for seismic evaluation of existing reinforced concrete buildings. In Bangladesh, PWD has published seismic evaluation standard through CNCRP project with Japan. What is the current seismic evaluation standard for existing RC building used in USA? Uh, okay, so US by now, things have been under development, I would say, since. Uh, uh, let me remember, 78, 81, uh, since the early to mid 80s, this area has received a lot of attention in, in the US. And now uh, I don't remember exactly when the first edition was, uh, we now have an ASCE standard, American Society of Civil Engineers standard 41, ASCE 41. So ASCE 7 is new buildings, for new buildings, design of new buildings. ASCE 41 is for evaluation and, and uh, I don't want to use the word repair, evaluation and uh, what do they use? <laughs> evaluation and and rehabilitation, let us say, of existing buildings. Very, very important document. Uh, I, uh, in this country, we also have an international existing buildings code, IEBC, just like IBC's international building code, IEBC's international existing buildings code. IEBC references AC 41. And IEBC is, is increasingly being adopted by local jurisdictions. So, so it is now uh, 
at long last. I, I would say starting with a, as as recently in the last five to ten years, uh, it's kind of organized now. Mo most places you will see IEBC adopted. And, and evaluation is almost invariably done now by ACE 41, which is a document that is easily available. Uh, take a look at it. I, I, I'm not familiar with the Japanese documents, so I do not know how they compare. Uh, most of the structures that were collapsed or damaged in past earthquakes were built in most developed countries like USA, Japan, Mexico, etc. These countries were then very much equipped with high technical knowledge, good construction quality, high material quality. So why this damage were happened? Is it due to is it due to special seismic design detailing was not available at that time? So I I <laughs> This is such a general question is difficult to but 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 let me let me tell you that uh, the uh, whole point of the uh, observations at the end of my talk was that uh, you know if, if 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 you spend enough money anything can be engineered and and to see that all you have to do is to take a short trip to Dubai, okay? So Dubai, you will find buildings that twist, that uh, have a smaller plan at the base, larger plan at the top. It leans, all kinds of things that you would do only if you have money to throw. Do not make any structural sense and, and, they, uh, and, and they do it. But but when you do those things, you make the structural engineer's life very difficult. Something that does not make structural sense can be engineered for, but it costs money. And the solutions are kind of forced solutions, though, as opposed to natural solutions. Okay. Some some things are natural. <laughs> and, 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 and that's the best way to go. Okay. And, and, and if you want to go beyond what is natural, natural thing is that as the loads decrease towards the top of a building, the column sizes stay the same or decrease. That's the natural thing. If you want to do the opposite of that, that can be done. It will cost you money. And, and because it is an unnatural solution, you 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 will never know all the all the unintended consequences that may ensue at some point in time and and what i said is generally true it is particularly true when it comes to earthquake resistance so so if you have irregularity yeah japan is a is a very advanced society 1985 they had a lot of technical knowledge at the same time, as I mentioned, the, the, the loss in the Second World War was a huge blow. That the place that Kobe was bombed out, completely bombed out. And, and, and without resources, what would you do with your knowledge? How would you build? So, so they came up with these solutions, uh, steel reinforced concrete, okay? And, and, and that, that uh, innovative solution had unintended consequences. They, they introduced irregularities in structures. And irregularity will do you in, particularly if it is not engineered for. So, so I, I, you know, knowledge is fine, but you have to have resources, you have to think and, and, uh, you have to design uh, considering what it is that you are designing, what it is that you are dealing with, and 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 also uh, and and also uh, the, the 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 construction has to be according to design. So uh, anyway, I think I have said enough. Uh, oh oh oh! I see I see. I was getting carried away. It's almost quarter to. Uh, whatever hour it is. Yeah, <laughs> I, I better stop. There are many, many questions. So 
Uh, any, anyway, these are good. I, as you can see, I, I enjoy answering questions. Uh, may, maybe we will have just question answer session. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see. So we, we, we will be, uh, <laughs> we will suspend this uh, face to face live, not face to face, <laughs> live seminars from the US. Uh, for Roja, uh, the the uh, until May the 18th, you will have other instruction. I definitely will not talk to you for more than a month. Uh, 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 anyway, so I uh, yesterday I was remiss. I I, I absolutely have to thank uh, Maria Iglipe who is sitting with me. Uh, she she is an incredible help help. Uh, Pro Das Gupta is running it from another location. Uh, he and, and he was participating in technical discussion, as you saw, which was very beneficial. And then there is Bodhi, who is uh, in touch with a lot of people through social media about these seminars. So I'm 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 very very thankful to this team, and 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 our team back in Bangladesh, uh, the. Uh, Shahid Alam and uh, uh, Dr. Rakib is, is an absolute marvel. We we depend on him for so many things, and 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 there are others that I could think. So, so have have a uh, uh, good month. We will talk to you in maybe five weeks or so. And uh, uh, well, I just I just want to interject yeah. here that yeah. some of the seminars we have coming up in the next month are actually live. But they won't be happening from the US. So those live webinars will be at, at your daytime. So when it is daytime, so it will start at 10 a.m. Dhaka time. And and then there are other webinars that will be recorded. And but they too have specific times when you will be able to access those recordings. So so uh, so go to the instruction page. I think I will go back to that. Um, That slide I showed before. So, so this, this, uh, the link I have on this, uh, on this slide. So go back there, type in your uh, order ID and email address, and keep an eye on the time, dates and times. That because the times change, and uh, you know, so keep, make sure that you have the correct time of each webinar. And you also know that which webinar is actually live and which ones are recorded. But we do have live webinars coming up in the coming month as well, just not from the US. Thank you. Well, thanks everybody and <laughs> good night in your case. Good night.